the lecture. Yeah, introducing ecology. Ecology in the biosphere. The biosphere, bio means life. And sphere is that in this case is loosely talking about everywhere around the earth that life can be, can exist. So that does include, of course, the atmosphere, the earth, um, the lithosphere. Basically, eco means home, and ology is the study of. So anything that ends with ology is the study of. Eco means home. So the so it has a, quite a broad scope. Mostly, ecology is thought of as the interactions between organisms and the environment. And they determine the distribution of organisms and their abundance. So we talked a little bit about our area here, which is technically known as the uh, Western Hemlock Coastal Temperate Rainforest. So you find conifers here. And you find really large conifers in some places. And that's partly because there are seasons. And seasons determine that some trees that are adapted to that kind of environment means they have to exist both in summer, spring, fall, and winter. And for conifers, winter is actually quite an easy time in a way because the needles keep the the um keep the tree from desiccating from losing water because in winter when there's a lot of snow there can also be um interestingly a lack of rain if the earth has permafrost so the water that we have and the water that's actually accessible to trees can be different some of our coast is Douglas fir. And Douglas fir likes a drier kind of environment. So you find it on the rain shadow of Vancouver Island, so this side where there's not as much rain. And you find it in places like Lighthouse Park because it's all rock and all the water just flows into the ocean from there. So there isn't a lot of accessible water to the trees. It's complex, that's for sure. Um, but our biosphere is enormously rich in the variety of species that can live in so many different environments. Sometimes you just can't believe it that some, some you know, lizards can live in the middle of the desert or that fish live at the bottom of the ocean. And yet they do. Lots of disciplines contribute to ecology. It's, it's a fairly broad kind of discipline. So meteorology, for example, climate, of course, that's a huge thing with ecology. Geology, what kind of bedrock do these, do these trees grow on? Um, so we talked a little bit about our climate. There's loads of rain on the coast. Geology, the bedrock is such that, um, and the soil is such that it's very, nutrient rich as opposed to the tropics which is nutrient poor um, paleontology population biology physiology genetics and animal behavior they all contribute to understanding ecosystems and the interactions between organisms and their environment So it's an ecological theater and an evolutionary play. So environmental factors interact with variation in populations that cause evolutionary change. So for example, here is a field mouse and its prey. So this prey, this, uh, sorry, it's predator. There are the prey, the predator, the owl. And the owl may cause a change in the community by going after the more noticeable kinds of field mice and that may change the population of field mice and over time species change to be more adapted to their environment why is it important well it shapes selection and evolutionary divergence so it is the reason why there's the array 
of species that we have on the planet in our various ecosystems. And also, Earth is finite. And that's something that you can understand at an ecological level that you would think you would think that would be a universal truth and that everyone would know that and we would adapt accordingly. But of course, that's not the case. We still treat the earth through economics in particular as being able to, we're able to grow indefinitely and the earth will provide indefinitely, but it's just not, it's, it's finite. Another very important point is that humans, we, we manage everything now. We manage the entire planet. There aren't very many populations of plants or animals that are self-regulated. So it's important to understand ecology. Uh, it's very rigorous. Um, it's, it's very scientific. There's a long history as a descriptive science, even from way back uh, biblical times, Aristotle, for example, he contributed quite a lot. He was very observant about nature. Um, Linnaeus contributed in naming species and Audubon in presenting species and, and also making field guides. Um, yeah, so it's the study of interactions between organisms and the environment. And one aspect of it that's pertinent to modern life on Earth is introductions of species into different environments. So this is a, a weird story that um, pythons were introduced to the Everglades in Florida. Pythons don't belong there. So what happened is that they're Burmese pythons and like people get snakes and they think it's terrific and, and uh, kind of novel. It's a novelty, you know, to have a snake. And then they start growing <laughs> and they start growing so large that they don't want them in their homes anymore. So they release them in the wild. And in this case, the Burmese python just loves the Everglades. It fits right in. The climate is good for it. It's got lots of prey, but it doesn't have predators. And this is just, a, this is just an odd story that I found about um, a python that had attempted to swallow an alligator and then the alligator burst through the walls of the python's uh, body and they both perished. Yeah, it's hard to tell here which is which. I think this, this is part of the alligator. This is the, this is the skin of the python. Part of the alligator is in there, but it burst through the skin. So it, it, uh, it killed them both. But really the python um, does not belong there, but the alligator does. The alligator is called the American alligator and the Florida Everglades is where it evolved. And it's lived there for a very long time. There's only two species of alligator in the world, the American alligator and the Yangtze alligator. So how do we study it? Well, to study the distribution of the Python that's been introduced, uh, researchers have tracking devices and they insert, they insert tracking devices into a python. This python's been sedated and they put the tracking device in it, let it go. And then as, a, as an ecologist, you go out there and track it. You track it with your equipment and figure out its distribution and also its population dynamics. So in order to understand how organisms live in their environments, you do need to know when they breed, where they breed, do they migrate, do they not migrate, what's their population size. Lots of questions that come up nowadays are, is the population increasing or declining, or is it on some kind of a cycle? And we need to know that because we manage populations. Who will win, the native species, the alligator, or the invasive species? Sometimes invasive is also known as exotic another name for invasive species. So an environment, environment is a bit of a loose term, but it includes, this is some terminology you may not know, uh, abiotic are components that are non-living. So things like wind, sunlight, temperature, pH, those are all abiotic environments. Biotic are the living components. 
A biota is a term given to all the organisms that live within an environment. Um, and we're not in class right now, so we can't describe a tank's biotic and abiotic variables. And I don't have a fish tank at home. But um, does anybody have a, a fish tank at home? No, we've got three of them at work, as you saw them, right, in the, in the lab. There's well, the one that was behind you in the lab is, um, is our marine tank. And we sometimes collect organisms from where we go to the intertidal. So there's sea urchins and that in there. Uh, so it is like a piece of the intertidal with water that we bring into the lab. So what could be the abiotic component of that small ecosystem? Um, maybe some like like rocks and stuff like that? Yes, yes, rocks and sand. And sometimes we call that collectively substrate. Substrate is what organisms live on. What else is in there? Is water abiotic or biotic? Abiotic. Abiotic, yeah, so water. What else? What about the water? What properties could it have? Oxygen. Oxygen. Yeah, so particularly, of course, dissolved oxygen, because that must be readily available to the organisms that live there. Uh, what about temperature? And salinity. Salinity is a, an important one when it comes to any kind of aquatic environment. And biotic, you've got your fishes. What else are in those tanks? Uh, algae. I think we had some crabs in there and snails. Good. So abiotic factors, non-living, that have an, a profound influence on what can live where is sunlight and duration of sunlight, uh, rain, of course, um, wind. So we live here on the coast. And so because the, the mountains trap the moisture coming off of the water, we get a lot of rainfall because that's where the, the, the water condenses. Yeah, but on the leeward side, so if it were the Rocky Mountains, the leeward side would be Alberta. Um, it's a rain shadow. So that's why you get a desert kind of environment in some of Alberta. Biotic factors. So these are the my biotic factors for the coast because I was in fisheries, so I tend to sort of veer that way. Um, these are salmon. This is a coho salmon. These are Chinook. Chinook are the largest of the Pacific salmon. And some of the influences are um, fishing. Other kinds of predation. And the human factor of salmon, one, one um, element of concern is fish farms that we have off the coast. And one concern is that the fish in the fish farms are subject to lice. They're called sea lice. And they could potentially infect um, salmon that migrate past the farms. So yeah, a fisher person, predators, fishes, those are all biotic. The water, the temperature, salinity, this would be a freshwater environment. So how do they affect the distribution and abundance of organisms? <clears throat> I like this picture because it shows, uh, it shows both rainfall and the number of kangaroos per square kilometer. So that's what this is showing here. K 
kangaroos per square kilometer. These are uh, grays, great uh, Western gray kangaroos. They're called Western grays. Uh, yeah, so the dark, dark color shows greater than 20 per square kilometer, and then 10 to 20, so less and less, 5 to 10, down to less than 0.1. <laughs> So what is the climate like? The climate mimics the number of animals you see per, um, per kilometer, per square kilometer. So the very most um, densely populated are there, then less densely, the red areas. I mean, that, that's because of the amount of precipitation. So southeastern Australia has very wet, cool climate. Um, although, sorry, these are red kangaroos. Um, they occur in semi-arid and arid regions of the interior, where precipitation is relatively low. So they're widespread. So this shows one to five per square kilometer. So the density of kangaroos follows the amount of precipitation, so the amount of rain per square kilometer. There's subfields of ecology because often you can't go and study something all at once. You have to get the little bits of information to put piece together. So organismal biology studies an organism's structure, physiology, and behavior that meet challenges posed by the environment. For example, uh, polar bears. If you were to study polar bears' anatomy and physiology, you might be looking at their adaptations to live in such a cold environment. Um, one adaptation is to cool off by spreading out over the ice. Um, another one is they have enormous paws to walk on snow and ice. may look at population ecology, concentrating on factors that affect how many individuals of a particular species live in an area. So a population is a group of organisms of the same species that live together in the same area at the same time. So they will be interbreeding. So you might ask some kind of question like, which environmental factors affect the reproductive rate of deer mites? Community ecology deals with interacting species in a community. Uh, we're looking at um, predator-prey relationships and that kind of thing. So we might ask a question like, which factors influence the diversity of species that make up the forest? There's a, an enormous difference between the diversity of organisms in the tropics and the diversity of organisms in our temperate rainforest. Ecosystem ecology emphasizes energy flow and chemical cycling on a larger scale. Uh, so we're looking at ecosystems, we're looking at not only biotic, which is what we did in community ecology, but also the abiotic components that affect them. So it's a community and it's abiotic environment. We might ask a question like, uh, which factors control photosynthetic productivity in a temperate grassland ecosystem? And productiv productivity is the reproduction and growth of um, any kind of organism that lives in an area. Fire is an abiotic variable. And of course, we've been subject to a lot of fires recently, uh, particularly, of course, in California, Oregon, and Washington, but in the interior of, of British Columbia as well. Um, so, a friend of mine in Australia was studying this little animal, a betong, a marsupial. And in Australia, as here and anywhere where there's um, um, humans inhabiting an area, naturally you, you suppress the fires. You suppress fires so that you don't burn down your houses, essentially. 
and so that you can camp here and there and also that so that you can uh, harvest the forest. So suppression of fires is something that's been going on quite a, a long time wherever there's human habitation but one effect of that is um, a buildup of fuel. It's kind of called the fuel load. So you get lots of branches and dried leaves. So if there is a fire, it's a big fire. All ecosystems, well, I shouldn't say all, most ecosystems have a fire component to their abiotic variables. It's something that occurs um, for, um, from, sorry, it occurs from lightning, for example. It's, it's just a natural thing. And many ecosystems are adapted to having periodic fires. So in Australia, the Betong population was not doing that well. Fires had been suppressed in this area for quite a long time. So my friend went in and um, caused some controlled fires. And what happened was, as it turned out, these are truffles. They grow underground. And when there's a fire, the sugar that would normally be in the leaves gets transferred into the roots. So the roots become very sugar rich. And so there's a, a, a growth or an explosion of truffles, the truffles which are kind of fungus. So the sugar's rich. There's a fungus growth in population, which results in a beton growth in population. And this is a cyclic um, event. And it was only discovered by, by studying the system, studying the population of betongs, the population of the fungus, and controlling the fires and where they occur. Landscape ecology is uh, larger. It deals with an array of ecosystems and how they're arranged. So here is um, a river and alongside, there is an area known as the riparian area. So the area directly adjacent to a stream or river is called the riparian. And it could be a, a corridor of dispersal. So a way in which animals can disperse in order that they're not out in the open and subject to predation. And then the biosphere is the largest uh, of the hierarchy. It's global. And it's the sum of all the planet's ecosystems. Uh, the lithosphere, the hydrosphere, and the atmosphere. So ecology provides a scientific understanding underlying many of our environmental issues that we have today. Uh, Rachel Carson is credited with starting the modern environmental movement. She wrote uh, a couple of books, Silent Spring, and the sea around us, she wrote that as well. And there, so she was a unique individual in that she had science training, but also was a terrific writer. And so she not only did impeccable research, but wrote it in such a way that it was understood by many people. So in her time, uh, she died quite young, of cancer, unfortunately. Uh, in her time, though, uh, pesticides were used, such as DDT. DDT was the big one, but there was lots of different ones used. And what was observed, uh, not just by Rachel Carson, but many people, is that songbirds were getting to be fewer and fewer. And so she worked very, very hard to show that there was a connection, not only a connection, but a causal connection between DDT and other pesticides and the birds, in that the pesticides get accumulated 
in the insects and that accumulated pesticide gets accumulated in the bird because they eat so many insects. And then often what happens is that the eggs can't hatch. The egg shells get very thin. So nowadays, uh, ecologists recommend following a principle known as the precautionary principle. So an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, managing resources within the confines of uncertainty. I'm going to underline uncertainty a whole bunch. <laughs> and I'm doing that because even though we have really good technology, uh, we are uncertain about things like population numbers. and ecological relationships. Because in order to understand any ecosystem, you, you really would have to understand every aspect of it. And, and, and you just don't, you just can't. Our ecosystems have evolved together. They're very complex. And so because we don't know that much, we have to, we have to be cautious about how we manage it. So in the fisheries, for example, um, you know, we have a preponderance of fish. <laughs> this is fish. <laughs> and uh, they're underwater. And we have pretty good sonar equipment. Nevertheless, a friend of mine in fisheries said once that um, you don't really know how many fish were there until a few years later, after the fishing season is over. So if you can only estimate the number of fish, say you estimate that there's somewhere between, I'm going to simplify it a little bit. So estimate is between 100 to 1,000 fishes in a given area, or fish in a given area, uh, what would you recommend the fishing quota be? So you probably wouldn't recommend that it's up on the high side. Using the precautionary principle, you should recommend that it's very on the low side. So fishing quotas, let's see, hang on. Fishing quotas consider um, uncertainty, the uncertainty of population sizes. Is this making sense? Any questions? So we use, well, we should use the precautionary principle in fisheries management and wildlife management. An alternative to say hunting. So this is where an ecologist would, would recommend, you know, uh, population sizes are decreasing because of hunting. And then, you know, someone else would have to come into the picture and say, well, Perhaps instead of hunting, we could have ecotourism. So instead of shooting with a gun, we, we shoot with a camera. And that's happened in a lot of cases. So for example, uh, particularly off our coast, we have whales. Some are doing okay, some are declining, but uh, we don't hunt them. So there's an international ban on hunting many species of whales. Not everybody abides by those rules, but uh, it is an international treaties, um, but there's a, quite a large tourist component to whales in the form of whale watching. And of course you have to watch the whale watchers so they don't disturb the whales. It's not entirely straightforward, but still 
better than decimating by hunting. So interactions between organisms and the environment limit their distribution of species, which is what we saw with the red kangaroo. We recognize global and regional patterns of distribution within a biosphere. Well, this, this is a broad distribution of, of um, climate, depending on latitude. And there were terms, I don't think they're as much in use anymore, but organisms are named very broadly for the area in which they come. So there's Nearctic, Palearctic, Oriental, Ethiopian, Neotropical, and Australian. So they're very broad categories. Uh, they take into consideration things like continental drift and mountain ranges and barriers between migration. So this kind of uh, uh, classification is largely due to Pangaea, the supercontinent of 250 million years ago, breaking up into smaller continents. I personally have never used any of these terms, but, but some people do. But the, sorry, the distribution of animals is known as a biogeography, or the distribution of anything, any living organisms, is biogeography. And it's very interesting to see how uh, animals and plants and fungi, how they happen to be where they are in the world. So biogeography provides a good starting point for understanding that question. Why do you find red kangaroos in a certain area? Why do you find grizzly bears in a certain area? So why is a species not in a particular area? Could it be because dispersal limits their distribution? In other words, are they, are they unable to disperse across mountain ranges or oceans? Um, if yes, then the area is inaccessible or there's not enough time to migrate there. If no, then what about behavior? Does behavior limit distribution? Um, are they tree-dwelling species? Are they non-migratory species? Um, if yes, then they're selecting a particular habitat for their reproductive behaviors, for example. If no, it might be something else. What about some biotic factor? Is there a predator present that prevents that species from living in that area? If yes, then it could be predation. Maybe you've discovered it's parasitism, competition, or disease. If no, that's not it. Is there some abiotic factor that limits their distribution? Could it be uh, water, oxygen, salinity? So that's maybe where an ecologist might start to discover why certain species live in certain areas. Dispersal is the movement away from centers of high population density or from the origin. And that contributes to global distribution of organisms. Natural range expansions are such that, uh, this, is the, this is the egret, for example, and its range expanded with the advent of fields and cows because the egrets will eat the insects that the cows uh, bring up by their hooves. A very stark kind of expansion of species is the starling. Have you ever seen the starling? It's quite a pretty bird, actually. This is a starling. They have them, they're all, they're all over the place. Um, in very large numbers. They're on Granville Island sometimes. I remember I was on Gravel Island with a friend and we were, um, we were eating grapes and I was throwing them in the air and catching them in my mouth. <laughs> and I did that for a bit. And then, and then I threw a grape up and a starling came along and just took it right out, just grabbed it and flew, <laughs> flew away with it. <laughs> so they're extremely adaptable starlings. Um, they don't have any predators in North America. So what happened in 1905 
This happened in New York. In 1905, in Central Park, somebody introduced starlings so that Central Park would sound more like home, which is Europe, England, I think, to be sure. Um, so they thought, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll add 100 starlings into the park, and then it will sound like home. But what they didn't take into consideration what the, was that starlings will fly away. They'll fly away from Central Park, which indeed they did. So I think the following year, they introduced another 100. But by 1915, they were spread out this far. By 1925, only 10 years later, they were this far across North America, already um, already moving west at very rapidly. In 35, they were halfway across the continent. In 1945, even further. And in 55, they've pretty much um, gotten to each coast. And right now their range also includes uh, much of Canada. So that, that's a stark example of expansion, range expansion, due to, if you were to study it and use those steps we saw, it's due to no predation. There's no predators. So in this case, they're present because they don't have any predators. But they also outcompete other animals quite readily. Grizzlies as well, their range has um, contracted. So grizzlies used to be around this area, the Arctic, quite far south. Um, but now their current range is here, basically a little bit into the United States, but not too much. Um, could that be because of livestock? I think it's a combination of land being used for livestock, the disappearance of forested land, and so their range is where there's still contiguous forest. Grizzlies need a they need uh, about, I think it's a thousand kilometers, a thousand square kilometers for their individual range, their needs. Uh, loads of species transplant, so that's much of our concern nowadays. Um, exotics are non-natives. So around here, you'll find this organism. This is a, this is called purple loose strife. And that was introduced into North America. It's very common now. And uh, we've tried to get rid of it. So a researcher at UBC came up with a biological pest to try and get rid of it. Uh, I think it was about 10% successful. If, if you just pull it out of the ground, the seeds disperse. So it's a di they're difficult to get rid of. Uh, Australia has had the most rampant introductions in their history since humans arrived. It's kind of crazy. These are rabbits. And rabbits really overran a lot of Australia. And um, they kind of decimate the land quite a bit. So what did they do? Well, I remember that um, they had bounties for rabbits. So people would go and shoot the rabbits. But they got rid of them in one area of Australia, but then they miraculously turned up somewhere where they could only have gotten to by train. So they thought maybe somebody transplanted them so they could continue hunting them. I'm not really sure if that's true. That's kind of anecdotal, but um, they are disruptive. They're disruptive to the vegetation. I can't remember when, but I think that yes. the same thing happened um, at the University of Victoria. Someone mm -hmm. released a rabbit, it was a pet, and, oh, yeah. or a couple of rabbits, and uh, they started reproducing beyond control. And after a while, there was just an invasion of rabbits uh, around the University of Victoria. Yeah. Yeah, I remember seeing some rabbits there. Crazy. There's some rabbits around um, Jericho. I think, I think in Jericho, 
they can they can hide within the fence of the of the um, sailing club from coyotes because coyotes will hunt them. But also, there's loads of blackberries in place of them to hide from predators. So I wonder if yeah, if they're introduced there around the um, around the university. They must have lots of hiding places. I don't know if there's coyotes around Victoria. Are there coyotes around Victoria? Around the university? I'm not entirely sure. I just heard this from uh, uh, from a friend who went there for his yeah. master's. And um, yeah. yeah, they were just putting signs all over the place not to feed the rabbits because- so, Yeah. Just I think, I, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I think they were- no worries, uh, Marcus. I think they were planning on hunting them and then there was like a bit of a controversy for for about doing that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh yeah, in case you accidentally shoot somebody's dog or cat or something. I'm just kidding. That probably wouldn't happen, but yeah. Shooting guns off in a populated place probably isn't a great idea. Huh. Interesting. Well, I guess like trapping them, like they, I guess some people thought it was inhumane and all that to do all that. So they just yeah, yeah. kind of left the populations. But yeah. Yeah, well, you know, the thing about introductions is it generally disrupts the natural cycling of an ecosystem. Yeah, so there's rabbits there. They're probably uh, dis dislocating. Is that the right word? other animals that might live there like different types of mice or um, voles or moles or something. Um, some organisms don't occupy all of their potential range. So there's a potential range and then there's a realized range. So um, this is an insect called the European corn borer. It occurs almost exclusively on corn. It could live elsewhere because of the climate and what have you, but um, the egg depositing females are attracted by the odors produced by the corn plant. So that's the only place that they, they breed. Biotic factors that influence distribution of organisms can include uh, loads of different kinds of interactions with other species, including uh, predation and competition. So this is a case of a herbivore limiting the distribution of a food species. So the experiment um, was about two algae eating animals, sea urchins, sea urchins and limpets, and a seaweed near Sydney, Australia. So this, is, this y axis is seaweed cover. So that's the percent of the, of the ground covered by seaweed. And this is time, so 1982 to 1984, it's an older study. Um, so reading this, this is called, this is called a removal experiment. So what happens to seaweed if uh, both urchins and limpets are present? That's the control. So the control is such that the seaweed is about the same. It doesn't really vary over that time. If you, if you remove only limpets, then you get this green line. If you remove only urchins, you get this blue line. And if you remove both, you get this purple line. So if you only remove limpets, there's no change to the seaweed cover. If you remove only urchins, you get a significant change. So it's the urchins that are having the major effect on the distribution of seaweed. Urchins like seaweed, they eat that. That's their, that's their main food source. Uh, let's see. Well, I just have a little bit more I want to talk about. Abiotic factors. Uh, temperature, water, sunlight, wind, rocks, and soil. We've already talked about that a bit, but I wanted to tell you about 
the difference between temperate and tropical rainforest nutrient cycling. Because if you ever go to the tropics, which I sure hope you do if you haven't already, uh, somewhere like Costa Rica or South America, somewhere uh, where there's a tropical rainforest. So this, for example, is tropics over here. And over here, we've got temperate rainforest. So if you were to go out here into our forests and walk, say, a kilometer, uh, you may run across 10 species of trees. If you were to walk that same kilometer in the tropics, you would come across 250 species of trees. So there's an enormous variety of organisms there. And there's many hypotheses. Um, one is that it, the, trop the tropical rainforests have not been covered in ice. So here, we've been, we were covered in ice 15,000 years ago. But in the tropics, they haven't been covered for ice for, I'm not sure how long, over a billion years. So there's been more time for competition to lead to more species that occupy uh, more and more uh, specialized habitat. Yeah, whereas in our area, our species, for one thing, have all come from somewhere else. There haven't been very many refuges from ice. But there's another factor, too. It's thought that in the tropical rainforest, there's no limit, no limit of sun or rain. in particular, temperature. It's always warm. Uh, the seasons are rainy season and dry season, essentially. Whereas in our temperate forest, we have our seasons, including winter. And in winter, you don't have a lot of growth. But in the tropics, in the rainy season, you have growth. Uh, in the non-rainy season, rainy season, you have growth. There's no limit of sunshine. However, what is different is that our soil here is rich in nutrients, and the soil in the tropics is poor in nutrients. And the reason is that in the tropics, there's such fast growth and such fast decomposition that any nutrients in the soil are immediately taken up by the plants. Whereas here, the soil can, uh, the nutrients in the soil remain there during the low growth times in winter. So our soil here tends to be more nutrient rich than in the tropics although the tropics are very species rich. Um, one sort of, it's a difference, but it's also a similarity between our temperate forest and the tropical rainforest is that uh, we, we log our forests, uh, deforestation, at an alarmingly fast rate. And there is replanting, of course, of trees, which is different than the tropics. It's very difficult to replant in the tropics. Uh, but it does take a very long time for our forest to grow back and to become the type of forest it ever was before would take between 1,000 and 5,000 years. In the tropics, deforestation tends to be by a slash and burn agriculture. So areas are burned in order that crops can be grown there. But the problem with that, coming full circle, is that um, so forest burned for crops, but because uh, soil is nutrient poor, The area only lasts for, you know, about five years, and then there's no nutrients left for crops. 
So uh, what are they called again? Charas, Charas, something like that. So um, cleared areas are fallow, it's called. When you leave an area to its own regrowth without using it. Temperature is very important. For one thing, temperature can determine whether there are many endothermic organisms or ectothermic organisms. Um, also, um, whether there's mangroves or salt marsh. So this is a tropical, very warm region. There's mangroves in the in, in the um, the boundary between the ocean and land. Whereas here, there are grasses between the ocean and land. So marshy kinds of areas with not large growth, but smaller growth. And that's largely due to temperature. Water is an enormous factor in species distribution. Um, so we might have a very moist environment here and we have loads of amphibians. BC has the most amphibians of all of Canada. If you're gonna ask me how many species, I don't remember. But um, in desert, you don't find amphibians because amphibians need water, uh, but you do find lizards. Sunlight intensity and quality can affect photosynthesis in ecosystems. Um, and not only for plants, so, so sunlight's obviously instrumental in photosynthesis and growth. So you get much greater growth and, and more species in the tropics, uh, less growth here. So for example, in, uh, let's see, here, if you had say a cedar after 30 years, maybe the same size as an type of tree in the tropics after four year growth. So growth in the tropics is just incredibly fast because of all the light available. But it can also, I should have you in there. It can also affect animals. So animals are sensitive to photo periods or or times of day. So uh, for example, the white-footed mouse uh, regresses the gonads in the fall and regrows in the spring, which is mating time. And it's mating time because the animals will be able to have offspring and the offspring will live through the summer and have loads of food before you get into the fall and spring. So they have a much better chance of survival during that time. You don't think of wind as having a huge effect, but it can. Uh, it amplifies the effect of temperature. Yeah, so heat loss by evaporation occurs when there's a lot of wind and it can change morphology. So this is a tree subject to a lot of wind. It's known as a kumholz. That means crooked wood in German. And we have some, a lot of trees like this on our coast um, particularly on the side that faces the ocean. Soil can limit distribution uh, quite easily. There's different kinds of soil, sand, gravel, clay, loam. They're different in the sizes of grains. So sand is very fine, gravel is not, clay is really fine. So that will affect what can grow there. Of course, acidity makes a big difference and the mineral composition of things such as calcium, magnesium, potassium. And climate, of course, is very important. Temperature, water, sunlight, and wind are the major abiotic components that make up climate. But you can look at climate on a big scale, on a macro scale, that affects a global distribution 
of organisms or microclimate on a very small scale. So you don't really think of that very much, but um, on this log, for example, what grows on the log is quite different from what grows underneath the log. Underneath the log, you get shade and it's much cooler. Um, on top of the log, there's less shade and warmer. And also water distribution is quite different in the two areas. Okay, I'm going to stop there for now.